Hello, guys. Um, happy Thursday. I know it's just recording and we were trying to go live yesterday at 2 p.m. Um, but of course, I was having some connectivity issues, but rightfully so to have some connectivity issues from yesterday. Um, we're going to get right into it. Uh, these chapters overall are very short. Um, but again, I definitely want to encourage people to free, uh, do some free thinking in terms of uh, public health and uh, communicable diseases, uh, infectious diseases, viral diseases, uh, something I just want you to kind of wrap your mind around. So 15 minutes, I'm going to do a recording. My timer's on. You guys can hear it. So if something goes down, if you hear the alarm, then that means I'm going to do my best to wrap it up just so you guys won't get bored because I know you got a lot of videos. If you have, if you have me, there's a couple of videos, but i uh, just going to get right to the point. All right, so chapter 10 um, talks about, let me pull the PowerPoint up. Um, chapter 10 is the re resurgence of infectious diseases. Um, and when we have infectious diseases, uh, we think of things like monkeypox, HIV, Ebola, West Nile virus, Zika, uh, influenza, and the new public enemy number one being COVID-19. Um, <clears throat> Those things are, you know, what we experience, they often come in outbreaks, which means that there is something pleasant or unwelcome that is going on that enters the environment um, in a very harmful way. Um, so that's really how we define or how public health defines uh, what an outbreak really is. Um, and then, of course, with outbreaks, you have certain diseases like HIV, where the outbreak, uh, outbreak occurs. No one knows its uh, path or how it developed. Uh, all they can put together is that it comes from men who identified as uh, homosexual or who identified as gay. Um, and it happened primarily in men. Um, you know, give or take, maybe about college age up until maybe maybe a little bit later in life. Um, so that was really the kind of the path at the time uh, that the U.S. population assumed it to be for HIV. And of course, with later studies moving forward, um, they discovered that uh, anybody can get um, HIV, anybody can contract HIV and how it's transmitted. So in terms of the others, such as uh, we're just going to go right into COVID-19, and maybe you've done some research and you've noticed that um, there are a lot of websites that says things are still developing, you know, things with COVID-19 are rapidly changing, uh, you know, so information is just updated on a continuous basis, rightfully so. Okay. It is a global pandemic, so you're really trying to target or do disease surveillance, which basic disease surveillance basically helps to track the progress or the progression of a disease and how it develops and how it mutates within, uh, in particular, in this case, it would be the uh, DNA for COVID-19, uh, but how a disease progresses over time and how it might develop. Um, so that's really the, the, the sole thing with disease surveillance. It kind of pinpoints from when someone has symptoms or when someone may have passed away as a result of disease all the way up into its development. So you're just really kind of pinpointing everything with disease surveillance. So that's the reason why you have things like contact tracers. Um, but the same thing can be said in terms of that's how we really define what an outbreak is, okay? Um, outbreak can be defined with just really just trying to target its path or its, its pathway of how we got from here to there. So when we think about COVID-19, you know, it's been identified that it did come from another country and it's pretty much airborne um, that it could come from uh, air droplets in terms of those who might be singing, talking, coughing, sneezing, uh, and so that's the, the concept between uh, concept with telling people to remain six feet apart. Um, I don't like saying socially distant because for the most part, like I'm doing right now, recording a video, we are still connecting socially, but we're physically distant. So there is a difference. But we'll use social distancing right now because that's a term that's been uh, used for an overextended period of time. But that's the purpose of social distancing um, is so, you know, those air droplets can essentially disperse, you know, just making sure that these people are about six feet apart, which is about two arm lengths. Um, <clears throat> so those are just kind of the concepts of how we kind of prevent outbreaks. OK, we just find a, a means to how to stop 
that particular spread, and then we just go right into it. Same thing with HIV. We find a, a method that stops us from the spread, and you know we we activate on it, and we um, we're mindful of its pathway. So that's really what happened with uh, HIV. It was identified that it is a sexually transmitted disease or an STD, um, and uh, you know the testing formats or the testing formats used uh, in terms of how uh, HIV is spread or how it can be detected. Now, um, there are screening tests that recognize the antibodies. Okay, what antibodies are? Antibodies are basically uh, proteins that recognize there's a foreign object in the body. Uh, and so uh, once there are antibodies in the body, it, what, what blood tests do, it'll determine what type of antibodies are in the body um, as far as what this individual has been exposed to. Um, so we all know that right now there are antibody tests for COVID-19. OK, um, especially for those who may have been sick or may have been exposed to it at, at any some point in time. So um, doing blood tests is probably your best bet in determining diseases and disease prevalence. Um, <clears throat> but with HIV, we already know that there are a lot of drugs available in terms of HIV progressing to AIDS. Um, and of course, there is no cure, um, but medication helps to regulate different symptoms that are related to HIV, as well as to prevention it from uh, moving into full-blown AIDS, which initially attacks the immune system. Okay, um, at one point, you know, back in the eighties, I'm I'm from that generation, from that decade. So shame on that decade. Um, but at one point, it was oh my gosh, I don't want to touch this toilet seat because this person sat on it may have HIV, or I don't want to shake their hand. Uh, so those are things that we just need to be mindful of in public health, and not only just in your uh, profession, but in general. As you are still in college, um, there's a possibility you may have ran into someone who might might be a carrier or something. So yes, it's always good just to be mindful just to be in that regular practice of washing your hands. However, it's not good. It's not a good idea to, you know, kind of treat somebody differently as a result of something that they may have. So uh, it's just all about just being mindful, um, you know, being respectful um, and not making that person feel um, less than because they might have uh, an infectious disease that offer that has no cure. So uh, it's just important to be very mindful of it. And back in the 80s, it was assumed that, you um, homosexual men were the only ones exposed to HIV. Um, HIV can be found in women. HIV can be found in heterosexual men. Uh, famous tennis player, Arthur Ashe, he passed away from uh, complications, uh, complications actually of AIDS as a result of a blood transfusion. So uh, those are just things just to be mindful of, okay? Uh, same thing with COVID-19. Even though COVID-19 has done significant damage to the black community, Anybody can still die from it. Anybody can still contract COVID-19. So those are just things just to be mindful of as far as infectious diseases are concerned. For the most part, no one is exempt. The only time where there might be an exemption, it might be due to region, not because of who the person is. All right. So, um, <clears throat> of course, uh, with HIV, uh, you know, Trans blood transfusions are not uh, not a regular thing anymore. Uh, they just try to find other alternatives in terms of someone who might be needing blood. Um, HIV can spread from mother to infant uh, through bre breastfeeding or um, during birth, or it can be prenatal while, um, lack of better term, while the baby's still cooking. Um, so um, we talked about a little bit of HIV treatments, um, and uh, we talked about, you know, where HIV originate. A lot of times uh, we hear different things coming from the good old fashioned monkeys. Um, I encourage everybody to do further research on how it originated. Um, uh, and we all know that um, HIV can be spread through uh, sexual content contact through uh, semen or vaginal secretions, so uh, as well as blood. All right, so there are other emerging uh, viruses such as Ebola, uh, monkeypox, which is not as harmful in, as humans, uh, but very similar to smallpox. Um, and same thing, a uh, concept that is found within monkeys. Um, Zika virus, uh, you know, other uh, different types of fevers. We've heard of West Nile virus and severe upper respiratory uh, 
syndrome. I believe it's syndrome. I had to look at the book and check. Um, but that's where SARS comes from. So, um, <clears throat> and again, later on, I won't add it now, but we all know our new enemy is now COVID-19. Um, so the question that I want to ask you guys, uh, thinking about in terms of who or the World Health organization, uh, do you think that they may, be, may have known that COVID-19, um, the, no, the novel coronavirus, in, in our case, in this current pandemic, do you think that the WHO may have known about it ahead of time? Um, if we're doing disease surveillance, then, uh, you know, researchers within the WHO, primarily public health officials, um, they may have been tracking different illnesses and diseases over a period of time. So to some degree, uh, maybe they knew that this was going to happen, or maybe there was a, uh, an assumption, or maybe there was data that may have led to the assumption that maybe the there was going to be a global pandemic. Uh, so just things to think about. That is a quiz question. So make sure you think about it and just answer very, you don't have to reference the book, um, but just give me some foundational things to make you assume that um, the World Health Organization, or maybe even CDC, uh, probably had an idea that we were getting ready to face a global pandemic, okay? Uh, now, when we uh, think about, um, <clears throat> we're just going to talk about the one thing that we're facing um, that is uh, right in our faces, um, as well as COVID-19, is influenza or the flu, Um that virus is constantly, constantly changing. It changes every year. There's a different strand every year. That's the reason why you have some people that are anti-vaccine or anti-vaxxers uh, that firmly believe that it's pointless to get a flu vaccine, okay? Um, I'm a firm believer that you should do your research. Um, by all means, if you feel as if that you don't need a flu vaccine, then justify your reasoning as to why you feel as though that you don't need a flu vaccine. If you do need a flu vaccine, you know what I'm saying? Maybe someone might be trying Trying to say, hey, it's pointless. You know, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, the reason why I get a flu vaccine because I work in the medical profession, and the last thing I want to do is I don't want to be the sole person responsible for a flu outbreak. I used to work in a university, actually, maybe a couple of years back, and it was happening at many universities. Uh, there was a flu outbreak here in Kentucky. Um, not on, uh, maybe in a couple of other states, but I do know that it impacted a couple of schools. Here, right here in the Commonwealth of a flu outbreak where there were so many college students that reported having the flu. I almost want to say this was about three years ago uh, that there was a lot of people reporting that they're having the flu. Um, actually, I remember one day coming to work in this location and there were 20 students that were lined up outside and there were almost 15 students in the waiting room uh, reporting flu-like symptoms. Um, but I'll tell anybody, I'll say this, um, this, and this is off the record, not tied to Kentucky State or not tied to the program. I firmly believe that if you do have symptoms of the flu, okay, I want you to, uh, do your best to try to, you know, doctor at first before you immediately go into a waiting room um, because the waiting rooms can be highly contagious. Uh, so just be mindful of that. I'm not saying don't go to the doctor. Didn't say that. Uh, but just be mindful of your symptoms before you go into uh, a waiting room and make symptoms and mat or matters worse for anybody else who might be in the waiting room who doesn't have flu-like symptoms. So those are just things to consider. Okay. Uh, flu has been an ongoing epidemic worldwide for almost almost 100 years, if not over 100 years. Um, <clears throat> with the flu in the United States, uh, it kills 40,000 40, Americans um, annually, which is about 8% of the U.S. population. But now that could change, okay? That could change because now we've had coronavirus or COVID-19, which actually has... Uh, you know, boosted that number by five times. So uh, those are just things that now that um, as research is constantly developing uh, that we're looking into as far as the data that's provided about COVID-19. So um, you'll notice that, uh, and I encourage you to submit this, I want you to find a chart that says, uh, that compares the differences between COVID-19, influenza or flu, 
allergies or cold. So I want you to find a chart that kind of lines up all three. And I'll set something up so you can submit to me what you think uh, those things are. Actually, no, I took that back. What I'll do, I'll have you guys uh, send it to me in the Remind app as far as finding a chart that says the difference between COVID-19, cold, flu, that type of thing. They're everywhere because uh, I know I have allergies, but I'll tell you, I'll tell you the truth. For a second there, I was like, oh, my gosh. But, um, of course, testing, you know, said otherwise is just allergies. But for the most part, you know, we could be confused and kind of scared as to feeling like we've got COVID-19. All right. So the one thing that we are mindful of, how many of us love to travel? I love to travel. Um, but one thing we just always need to be mindful of in terms of infectious diseases is traveling okay sometimes in traveling we could pick up a little bit of everything and we bring it right back into into the states into our homes into our personal lives with our children our spouses your colleagues your co-workers your classmates your roommates so you know those those are some factors that kind of play a role in, in uh infectious diseases is international travel uh, that's the reason why it's so important that before you board or long before you board, you should definitely check to see if there is oh, I'm at my time. But I got to go a little longer because I got some stuff to give y'all. Um, but it's important to know what type of vaccines are needed in that country or what you can do to protect yourself. Um, let me make sure it's nobody. Yep. What? Um, things that will protect yourself from spreading the disease. So uh, just always make sure that you are definitely doing your research to check to see, um, yeah, what could be spread or, or what could what could you prevent the spread of before you enter that country. And of course, you know, just making sure that you're just being mindful about uh, different sexual activities. I, you guys are smart, so I don't even have to go into that. But uh, it's all about just being mindful about being safe during intercourse uh, and not just safe as far as uh, from a physical standpoint, but safe from a mental standpoint. Okay, Making sure that, of course, the partner that you're with, um, it is 100 percent consensual. I mean, like 100 percent consensual. There is no nothing to be taken from it. So those are just factors just to be mindful of. And that can essentially reduce the spread of infectious diseases. All right, we talked about influenza a little bit. Um, you know, we have things like E. coli. We hear about E. coli happening in food primarily, um, as well as Legionnaire's disease. Legionnaire's disease recently was within a hotel, I believe, in Atlanta. Um, and we hear about Lyme disease. Um, <clears throat> and we do have some uh, bacterial infections or diseases um, that are antibiotic resistant, one of the ones being um, MRSA. Um, and, you know, MRSA can be very fatal if not treated um, quickly, rather. Um, but oftentimes, uh, antibiotic resistance is, is found in uh, different agricultural aspects of it. So just to kind of keep the E. coli away. So, um, yeah, we may have heard about an E. coli outbreak in our spinach or your lettuce or your onions. So that definitely can happen. <clears throat> okay, we talked about, uh, well, we may have mentioned tuberculosis briefly, um, but, uh, you know, TB is still something that some of us are still getting a vaccine for. Um, you know, there was a resurgence of TB in the 1990s. Um, and it is uh, uh, transmitted through aerosol. So, and people with HIV are at a high risk of contracting TB. Um, but however, since HIV is a, a, a impacts the immune system, um, people with HIV are at a high risk of contracting um, infectious diseases very quickly um, and very easily. It's very similar to those who have cancer. And we'll, get, we'll talk about cancer. Um, briefly. Um, uh, there's prions, uh, which I won't talk about too much uh, because uh, I'm not very knowledgeable about prions. Uh, but as we can see here, looking at the uh, PowerPoint, it looks as if kind of your agent is found in uh, animals. So, um, but again, I won't talk about that too much. Um, so the main public health response to emerge, uh, infectious diseases as they emerge is that we are mindful about, um, sorry, I have so many distractions here this morning. Um, we do uh, 
surveillance. We do disease surveillance as well as monitor, um, you know, the animals that we might be having on our farms or basically kind of like an agricultural or veterinary uh, surveillance. So just constantly checking on your horses, if you have cattle. Um, and basically another concept to think about is uh, having exotic pets. Some people have sloths. Some people have um these most random pets from different countries. Um, my firm believer, I'm a firm believer that if it's not a dog or a cat or a fish, it don't belong in this house. So um, I just feel like some animals should remain in the wild and they should not be housebroken. But you have some people that'll try. Why not? If you have the money, you could do it. Um, but these are aspects that are very important, just monitoring the progression of a disease, where its vector or its source, where it comes from. Um, and that way, the disease surveillance is used to be able to come up with medication either to cure or prevent um, the spread of or the development of that particular virus. So now what I'm going to do is that I'm going to transition over to chapter 11, okay? Uh, talks about the biomedical basis of chronic diseases. Um, and we know chronic means long-term, right? So chronic being, when I think of chronic, automatically I think of uh, cardiovascular disease. And I want you to, as a test question, I want you to identify two uh, cardiovascular diseases that are the primary killers of um, American citizens in the United States. Um, but we all know, uh, to the in a nutshell, cardiovascular disease um, is tied to poor diet, um, tied to lack of physical activity, um, increased levels of stress. Um, there are some other uh, aspects that could lead to cardiovascular disease, uh, such as uh, we know about emerging reports uh, have come out and said that COVID-19 is responsible for those who might be going through heart failure, uh, myocarditis, uh, which is inflammation of the cardiac muscle that is around the heart, um, so uh, or lining rather. Um, so, I mean, those are just things that, uh, those outside things that, um, have the potential to lead to cardiovascular disease, but primarily um, there are primarily the stress, the lifestyle, and the diet, and that really leads to cardiovascular diseases, but there are two main ones, two, um, and that is a test question. Um, but uh, going right into it, it talks about chronic diseases, uh, you know, a long period of time of the onset. Uh, so as students, it's so important for you to learn about stress management now, okay? Um, because later in life, there's going to be a number of things that are going to stress you out. If you're like me, you know, just transitioning everything online, that alone is stressful, Um so what we need to know about chronic diseases is that even though in the now, oh, yeah, doctor said I have this, that, and this, I'm fine. Even though we say that now, but if we allow it to progress without proper treatment, it can really hurt us in the long term. Uh, so those are just things that we just need to be mindful of about chronic uh, diseases. They can kill us over time. All right. So uh, additionally, atherosclerosis sclerosis, um, is another aspect to cardiovascular diseases, um, which is the hardening of the arteries, which, uh, of course, you know, your arteries, think about it like a, I don't want to say a straw, but think about it as a Twizzler. We've had a Twizzler before. And just imagine, you know, in order for maybe, let's say I was a creative kid. I used to drink like chocolate milk through a Twizzler, through a thick Twizzler. Um, and, you know, I would try to fix a hole through the Twizzler to be able to get fluid through the opening that I created within the Twizzler. That's how our, our, our vessels essentially work. Our arteries work. Uh, they are pliable. They're really bendable like a Twizzler, uh, but they need that open space to allow fluid such as blood to be circulated um, throughout the body. So it's very important to have that free space. Um, and what can uh, clog, clog the arteries? Basically cholesterol. Um, and there are two types. Uh, that is a test qu a quiz question. Okay, I want you to identify the two types of cholesterol and identify the differences between the two. 
All right. So we talked about um, diet, high blood pressure, diabetes, and we'll get into diabetes in a second. Uh, one thing I want you to notice is that the American diet raises the risk. OK, I want you to think about the American diet as much as we love it, it is definitely tearing us apart. Um, so um, and the reason why some people could dispute like, oh, there's nothing wrong with the American diet. We're probably the only people in the country that firmly believe that bigger and more is better as opposed to being mindful of what our limits are, what we should eat, what we shouldn't eat. Uh, case in point. You could go into a gas station and get like a tub of soda. Where do you do that at? A tub of soda? Oh my gosh. So essentially you can get a tub of soda from a gas station and basically people drink that all day. So just basic, just do the math. Think about it like this and you can definitely find it and send it to me through the Remind app. There's uh, usually charts when we talked about um, <clears throat> social math, taking the data and interpret it into something that somebody can learn from. Uh, find you a chart and you can send it to me through the Remind app that talks about the amount of sugar in different drinks. So think about that particular diagram with one can or one bottle of soda okay how much sugar is in that so just mentally calculate having a tub worth of soda to drink all day just imagine all the sugar so that's the reason why the american diet is is really bad so um <clears throat> Additionally, uh, genetics do play a role in the development of chronic diseases. Um, I, like myself, as one who identifies as a Black woman, um, I uh, genetically am disposed to uh, primarily hypertension. Um, and so for me, it's very important for me to get into regular physical activity, especially cardiovascular activity, as well as myself getting into uh, any activities that allow me to reduce my stress level. So I don't know if you guys notice, but one of the ways that I reduce my stress level is that I am not that responsive over the weekend, with the exception of maybe something that is serious or something that I can easily address. Um, outside of that, I try my best not to do any responding at all on a Saturday, Sunday. Uh, but that's because managing my stress is very important to me. So those are just things that I'm just mindful of. I'm just mindful of the stress level. Also, another aspect of it in terms of managing stress is that I'm so mindful about the people I am around. Okay. If you are, I'm not saying you guys, I'm saying in general, if you are just causing excessive stress, excessive drama, then I leave it alone. So uh, that's I got off my soapbox as far as uh, stress management, cardiovascular disease. OK, a uh, little bit of hypertension. Make sure that you go get your blood pressure checked on a regular basis. I know women as young as 25 who've had a massive stroke. So make sure that you are checking your blood pressure regularly. All right. Now, cancer. OK, nobody likes cancer. I don't like cancer. I lost my father to cancer. Um, I currently have an aunt fighting cancer and I have a couple of friends that are currently fighting cancer in a nutshell in lack of better terms or description of what cancer is. So let's say, for example, you know, we accidentally cut ourselves on our skin. Right. OK. The normal response to your body uh, in a cut um, is to be able to send maybe like the the right response, the antibodies, your body's going to automatically respond to, okay, something is foreign going on with the body. Um, so there, you're basically, your body is going to automatically respond to the healing process to close that cut. Okay. And so of course you're going to see, you're going to see blood and you're probably going to see a little pus, the gross stuff, and then eventually it'll turn into a scab and that scab will go away. So what cancer is, is basically not saying that it's an injury, but what cancer essentially is, is that as the body starts to do kind of a repair process of different cells, what happens is that uh, there is something that's going to disturb that process and it's going to start mutating as far as cell reproduction um, almost very rapidly or almost uh, in a way that is not normal. So uh, that's where cancer comes in. OK, uh, and, you know, we're talking about like different things that can uh, expose us uh, at a higher rate of cancer, such as uh, tobacco use. We talked, you know, I may have I, a couple of years ago, we've heard about sun tan or getting tans and tanning beds, um, putting people at a higher risk of getting skin cancer. Um, so but primarily we're talking about tobacco and rightfully so tobacco. 
uh, tobacco use or cigarettes um, just have a lot of stuff in it. And so, and thinking about how your body should constantly regenerate itself, uh, we're essentially putting stuff harmful toxins in our body that's not allowing our body to regenerate ourselves in, in the healing process. So um, those are just things to just be mindful of in terms of cancer is concerned. Um, but there are many screenings. Uh, there are many screening processes that helps us to uh, detect cancer early um, to make sure that um, it's caught early, it's treated early, and what needs to happen as far as a uh, preventing the spread or preventing, uh, uh, you know, of course, um, mortality. So and diabetes, uh, this is a test question. There are two, as I'm looking at the screen, there are two, and I want you to identify those two types of diabetes and what are the differences, okay? Both are, uh, there does need to be some long-term monitoring to both types, um, but of course, uh, lack of medical care can, uh, do some serious harm on the body. So uh, just make sure that uh, you identify those two and what are the differences. Uh, primary complications of diabetes, uh, amputation of extremities uh, due to uh, poor circulation, uh, wound care healing. So my cut may not, or someone who has diabetes, their cut probably won't heal as fast as my cut as someone who does not. Um, of course, kidney failure and blindness. All right, so there are other um, chronic diseases in public health uh, that need to uh, be presented as far as uh, where more attention is needed. Uh, for me, um, in my personal interest as someone who's interested in like health coaching and health promotion, um, I'm interested in the mental illness aspect of it because of mental health um, or if there's a mental illness that goes untreated, it can lead to um, serious serious impact. And it's not just related to suicide. Okay. It could be, it could lead to uh, financial issues. Um, if we're not addressing certain mental illnesses, it can lead to loss of certain relationships or meaningful relationships. Um, you could possibly get uh, uh, in trouble with the law as far as mental illness is concerned if left untreated. Uh, so for me as a personal interest, I'm very interested in the chronic disease of mental illness and its impact over time. Um, because um, what we don't realize is that if we don't treat the mental illnesses that are currently going on within us now, um, <clears throat> from an exercise science standpoint, that does play a role in our physical fitness and our, our kind of like our intrinsic and extrinsic motivators as far as what gets you going to be physically active. All right. So um, you're not going to go into the discussion questions. What I'll do a little bit later is that I will um, I will put up a um, quiz for you. It's going to be short answer. And um, yeah, it's not going to it's just an opportunity for you to make to for me to see that you guys are participating and watching the videos and making sure that you understand what's going on. Don't forget that there are discussion pieces that need to be completed. Okay. If you need to get a hold of me, I will say that uh, after 12 p.m. tomorrow, I will be unavailable until Sunday night. Okay, uh, so those are just things just to be very mindful of in terms of reaching me over the weekend. I'm not saying I don't want to, but it'll probably be hard to reach me over the weekend. But if you have any questions, let me know. Uh, I will talk to you soon. You guys have a fantastic weekend. Peace.